I'm Richard Fishman. I'm the director of the Grand Ave Center and the Creative Arts Council, and it is a thrill uh, for many of us here to um, bring, this, bring this gathering together. Um, I don't think I've seen this building jumping as much as it's jumping today and being used, uh, except maybe the time Julie uh, had a class that went into every space of this building when we first opened. Well, Tom, you're running a close second. Uh, the fourth dimension is available for viewing on every floor, and then you can walk into it in the computer-aided visualization um, machine on the third floor, which if you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, I'm only going to spend 10 more seconds because Tom has a great show that he has been working on for the last 47 years. <laughs> and um, just to tell you one, one last thing, when I was in the gallery earlier this, this afternoon, somebody was mesmerized looking around at uh, all of the work that Tom put together. And uh, he said, uh, when am I going to meet the artist? He didn't know that Tom was a mathematician. But Tom is the artist. And this let me say, welcome, Tom Banchoff. And thank you for doing what you've done here today. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be able to give a class in this building and to be challenged by the, uh, all the kind of planning that went into it. Uh, Richard and I were both on the Creative Arts Council together, and I watched as this thing took shape and developed. And I've been able to come to a number of conferences to see how people have utilized it. And the challenge of trying to use so many different aspects of it to, uh, to show a key idea was something that was uh, a lot of fun to think about. The fourth dimension is a key idea, and I think I'd like to make the case that it's fun. At least we have had a lot of fun <coughs> with it, mainly because it brings people together. And it's brought together a number of colleagues over the years uh, and uh, to do creative things that, uh, in my case, always made me feel that I was learning things that I couldn't have done, certainly by myself, and couldn't have done just by listening to one other person. But the chance to do a natural kind of collaboration, I think, is, is really a very special gift. And we've been gifted here at Brown because I'd like to make the case that collaborations, natural collaborations, happen more naturally here than other places. Uh, I'm not sure I want to compare them with other places, but I do want to talk about the richness that they bring to the experience of examining your own things, but seeing them through the eyes of the people who are working with you. So we have people here whom you've seen if you've been in the, the show because uh, five of them are colleagues uh, who uh, go back, seven, uh, well, let's see, uh, 45 years or more. And uh, one of them is uh, uh, special in a different way, and we'll see how that works out. Uh, the, what the difference is that uh, we have uh, uh, less than an hour to talk to you about the stories that uh, bring us together. So if you do the mathematics, that means each of us has about five and a half minutes uh, to talk about what he or she uh, really would like to say. Uh, I would. Uh, like to encourage uh, people in turn to say some things and hopefully have some time at the end for some questions and comments from people in the audience. Uh, I know some people in the audience have questions and comments to, to ask or, or make. So uh, let me just introduce by name and, and ask the people who are here uh, to say something about the kinds of collaboration and respond to my statement about Brown being a special place for collaborations. So. Uh, I suppose I should do it chron chronologically and, and say that Richard is the first person, and you've already read Richard Fishman, who is the director of the uh, Creative Arts Council and also artist, uh, sculptor extraordinaire. Shep Shapiro, next to him, music, is the second person I met through a mutual student. Uh, Tom Webb, I think, was a neighbor up mm -hmm. on the east side. Uh, Julie and I met because, uh, Julie Stremberg and I uh, met uh, because we had students together at the same time 
and Julie claims that she actually heard me give a lecture sometime <laughs> independently. Uh, Tom Webb uh, has uh, continued to uh, come to my class, as everyone else has over the years. Arnold Weinstein came a little bit later, but has uh, probably talked more than the rest, because I think you've talked at least five times yeah, I think so. uh, about comparative literature. Uh, the concept of the fourth dimension is one of those things that uh, has many, many ramifications. But if you go to a cocktail party and meet somebody for the first time, and you say you work in the fourth dimension, what do they always say? That's time, isn't it? You know? <coughs> and what do I say and what do my students learn how to say? Time isn't, time is a fourth dimension. It isn't the fourth dimension. There are many different kinds of dimensions. Then you talk a little bit about how physicists use time. But that's only one way in which time acts as a dimension. It certainly acts as a dimension in art, in music, in dance, in geology, and in comparative literature not to mention computer science, okay? So, that's enough. You didn't introduce me. Well, computer science. <laughs> <laughs> the very first collaboration here, I, I have a picture here of Charles, was with Charles Strauss. And Charles Strauss uh, is also almost in the 70s. Unfortunately, Charles Strauss died in February. And it's a great loss to all of us who care about collaboration. Uh, fortunately, representing computer science is a person who has five or six dis different reasons for being here on the panel. But we'll have to wait till the end because I'm going to leave him to have the last person to talk about himself. Okay? So, Richard. Are we getting feedback on the sound system here? Yeah. yeah. In, the, in, the, in the booth, could you do something <coughs> about the sound, please? Thank you. Got it. Well, it was, I think, uh, when Tom came, 1967, yep. uh, the new curriculum uh, was beginning to percolate, the idea of it. And then maybe it was 1970 when he and I, well, I guess you came, you'll have to correct me, my memory is uh, not accurate on this. You must have come to me and said, do you want to teach a course together? Well, actually, you came to me and said you wanted some help with the sculpture. <coughs> oh, that came first? That came first. Okay, so then here's what we, yeah, I needed, I needed help. I had been working on a large sculpture. Imagine a, a sphere cut in half and opened up to be cast hollow in bronze. Except I didn't want to make it simple. I wanted to, uh, I didn't want a perfect hemisphere. I wanted the sphere cut maybe uh, two-thirds of the way up. So imagine a two-thirds of a hemisphere. And I needed to know the volume that that contained in order to make a mold with the expandable polystyrene that if I didn't have the right volume, the whole mold would break and explode. So okay. I said to Tom, can you help me with this problem? And we figured it out to the mil cubic millimeter. And it worked. Yes, and except. It was, and it was fabulous, except. At one point, uh, I said to, uh, to Richard, when you put the top on, there was a, 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 an additional piece of wood underneath. And he said, yes, that's there to hold it. And I said, did you count that in the volume? And he said, uh, no. Do you think I should have? At which point we heard, crash, crash. <laughs> <laughs> so the plaster, it had this clamp down, and it was, yeah. <laughs> but it was, it still worked. It worked, because yeah. it was not, it was not um, too yeah. large to destroy everything. So that's how I met Tom. Yeah. So then tell me how I, uh, then it came to pass. I don't, I don't know whether it was you or me, or maybe Peter Stewart. Mm -hmm. Because Peter Stewart was a bioengineer before people knew what bioengineering was. But he was really interested in growth and form, both in art and in mathematics. And uh, I, somehow or other, the three of us got the idea that growth and form in mathematics, biology, and art was something that we could all really get to. So uh, as a 
I was actually a lower rank than either Peter Stewart or Tom because artists, when they entered, were instructors, <laughs> not even an assistant professor. So um, the new curriculum encouraged faculty to put together what are called modes of thought courses. So instead of a given subject, it is a way of thinking, and hence the modes of thought, which then encouraged very early on the kind of interdisciplinarity and collaboration that Brown has become known for, and which all of us are constantly renewed uh, by that kind of activity here. So um, I've always been interested in, in form, in biological <coughs> form, and in anything that connects to other sciences. So biological form also had mathematical aspects to it. Think of the Nautilus shell, that beautiful uh, enlarging spiral, which I think if you, if you put a grid on it, it's the golden mean, is it not? Mm, golden ratio, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. golden ratio. And so uh, we got together and we taught this, this course. Of course, you had to teach this course in addition to your other two yeah. courses each semester, so we taught it at night. Yes. And was it, was it one or two nights? I think one night for three hours. One night for three hours. And then each of us would give a, an assignment. We would give a talk, a lecture, a demonstration. And the students were then asked to respond to that week's um, mm -hmm. concept with a work of some sort. Yeah. That's how I recall it. Yeah. Yep. So. Yep. That, and I think that that's our f uh, six minutes. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And now it's me. And now it's Chef. Right. <clears throat> this one, you don't, you think this one is, let's see. Oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can talk like this and you can hear me from. He wants it. He wants no, it. No, he wants it. He wants it. All right, how's this? That's good. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, what I want to do uh, is to play uh, the collaborative project that we did together uh, so many years ago. You can tell us the year. It was uh, 25 years ago. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. And so. <clears throat> and uh, so this is a th uh, about three minutes and 45 seconds. Maybe we can touch shut down some of the lights here that, that are so bright. Is, would that be possible? Yes.
And so um, um, I was thinking about uh, collaborations, and uh, of course, Tom is a spectacular collaborator. Uh, um, but uh, I don't know if it's totally because he's good at collaboration. And we make a kind of almost a fetish, you know, we collaborate, do interdisciplinary stuff, isn't that great? But in a case like this, uh, what Tom brought to this project was mastery and a strong idea himself of what he wanted to do. He had a, a complete a, a peace in mind. Um, it, then, uh, then he cut it to the music, but he didn't lose track of what he was trying to do mathematically and artistically, uh, you know, but he brought all that to the project and made it work. For me, this was uh, perhaps even more of a collaborative process because at that time and previous to that time, I had been working um, <clears throat> besides as a composer, as a consultant to the instrument companies that were making the synthesizers of the day. And this was uh, the first of the digital synthesizers, uh, standalone. This is before one had computer music. This was still called electronic music back in the day. Um, and uh, this was actually the first piece that I did on that new mm. uh, system, mm. uh, a system which I had worked on collaboratively to, to, to develop and, and build. Uh, so it was nice. And, and it was already a piece. Same thing. I had a clear vision of what I wanted to do, and I brought it to our collaboration. <clears throat> and then we found, I think, Collaborations work more by serendipity than anything else, you know, that those two ideas could come together and make such a piece as this. Um, I had one more thought that may be of some interest about collaboration. Um, <clears throat> composers, of course, are great collaborators because uh, if you write, as I do, music for players to play, you must collaborate. I was in, this morning rehearsing for a premiere. Uh, that's coming up this Saturday of a string quartet. The most collaborative experience. They play a little, I sing a little, we change things and make it work. And yet, at the same time, composers are the most solitary of people. That piece was six months of work, all alone by myself, uh, maybe half time or so, to, you know, to, to write the piece. No feedback, no collaboration, you know. So, uh, we learn then what we need to bring. I guess that's it, and that's what made that's what makes me talk in this way. We need to bring to the collaboration with the player this strong image of just what we want, and then we need to listen to the players to what they can do and what they bring to the piece, and they need to have that mastery of playing and bring that strong idea, and then we can have a valuable collaboration with something to say at the end. Thank you. Oh. Well, I uh, knew Tom Banshaw first as a neighbor across the street when we both lived on Lancaster Street. And then I happened to go to a lecture he gave to the freshmen one year and was totally impressed by his presentation and the sort of renaissance sense that he brought to both mathematics and uh, literature with his talking about flatland. And uh, shortly thereafter, he ran a uh, fourth dimension. There was a, uh, you had a meeting here on the fourth dimension yeah, that I got included in. And uh, one of the <coughs> contemporaries of mine at Swarthmore College, Rudy Rucker, a mathematician and a science fiction writer, showed up for it, which was fun. And uh, so Tom and I, I got talking to him about some of the work I do in geology, looking at uh, past times and uh, data uh, that I can work with in space and time simultaneously. You know, we geologists view time as, as a solid dimension, you know. As you go down, it gets older, so time flows upward. 
we got a clear sense of direction. It's not this whether it flows from left to right or it's up. And uh, so I, uh, I, we, we shared a student at one point who did some work for me and under Tom's direction. And then I was on sabbatical out in Colorado in 1988 and Tom called me up and he said, I'm doing this book that was beyond the third dimension. And he, I described to him the work we were doing and what all was going on. And the next thing I knew, here was this manuscript uh, for the little part I have in that book. And uh, all I had to do was supply some illustrations, which I did, and there I am published in that book. And the best part of it is that my piece, where he talks about pollen and changing vegetation through time, comes just before the illustrations of the Alhambra. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's that, what do they have, the opening act, I'm the opening act for the Alhambra in the book, if you like. You know, these minor claims to fame we can make. Um, I have to make one comment that uh, I did send you the draft. Yes. And you were very kind about the corrections you made in the draft, <laughs> but it came out very well. But it came out more or less from more what I said on that telephone yes. call, so yes. I, I enjoyed it. I, I did throw in a few slides just to, in an attempt here to show a little bit of what we can do. We'll see if they, uh, they are, uh, somebody will have to click the button to click them through. At any rate, I have fun. I studied the last 21,000 years. I did it for 50 years, and now, well, I should have put five minutes, yes. right, didn't I? But that's the way we collapse everything. So here are where pollen grains come from on a pine tree, and there's a pollen grain up there. We always think of it a Mickey Mouse Club hat. And if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. The thing, pollen falls into lakes and then gets caught up in the sediments in the lakes and that you can then view through time. Here we are out coring on lakes uh, in Miles Standish uh, State Park in Massachusetts. <coughs> the pollen arriving in lakes represents a landscape around it, so it's an average picture of the vegetation around a lake. Go to the next. And in New England, if we follow the amount of pollen at different times, there's 12,000 years, here's zero. You can go from a time of spruce pollen, like we were in Labrador, to pine pollen, northern New England, and then on up to hickory and uh, chestnut, a changing vegetation through time that you can follow. Next slide. But here's a map of the data with the cores across North America that we have. And this is where we begin to see that if we go to the, that uh, we can then look in time and in space from this sort of a view. Next slide. This shows the picture for the various prairie plants from, if you just, that's 8,000 years ago, keep clicking seven, you can get an animation here of the changing prairie forest boundary as it went east and now is coming back west to the present day. Next slide, showing modern vegetation. And there was that prairie forest boundary with the other vegetation in North America. And then if we go to the next slide, a depiction of what went on for the prairie forest boundary now with isochrones and this means that 9,000, you see the nine, the prairie was way in the west, and then at 6,000, seven, eight, it had moved east and then back. So now if we look and think about seeing all of this, we'll see the time dimension going back into the board, and north is up, and uh, e east is to the right, then here's, the, no, go back, please. The, here are three-dimensional contours depicting what those isochrones show. It's sort of like a, a curtain moving wet east and then west through time. And so we have three-dimensional contours here uh, that I could play with. And the thought that I had once you have three-dimensional contours in a three-dimensional box 
If you have two-dimensional contours, which you see on a topographic map, you know to sort of expand those into a third dimension. So three-dimensional contours might expand into a fourth dimension, though I've always had trouble trying to see it, but I always <laughs> thought that was a cool idea and part of what we worked on. So let me stop right there and say thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Arnold. Uh, I'm the low-tech guy here. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, so I don't have any expertise technically. I notice that we've been seeing a lot of images, and as a literature person, um, time is what we can't see. I also think that as a person with a retina, time is something that I can't see. Uh, and that's, I think, how writers approach it, as a drama in life, as unavailable to perception, but of course as one of the key ways in which we parse relationships. And so from a literature point of view, many writers have wrestled with this. Uh, Freud, who wasn't quite a literature person, but I think the psych department would say he was. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, in a famous episode in Civilization and Its Discontents, talks about a person being in Rome in the early 20th century, armed with a good bit of anthropological and archaeological knowledge. But he would only see the Rome that is the Catholic Rome with St. Peter's and the various churches, but he wouldn't be able to see the Rome of the emperors because those buildings no longer exist. They're underneath the structures that have built on top of it. Nor would he see the Rome that preceded the pagan period. And what Freud argued, and he had reasons for it, is that we can't see in one space more than what occupies it. And for him, this was a figure of trauma, residues in human psyche that are there, but are not easily visible. Uh, other writers like Proust, a very famous episode of a Madeleine, he eats a piece of pastry and all of a sudden, pop, his entire past comes back to him. So those are some of the issues that for me were interesting and Tom generously asked me to come and meet with some of his students and his fourth dimension course to talk about these things. So I said there's drama in that. Uh, there's drama in these notions. They're cued to trauma. They're cued to recall. And they're also cued, I think, to a great deal of emotional pathos because one cognate for all of this is memory. And um, my earliest memories of Tom, I think, are three-dimensional before I entered his fourth-dimensional world, which is when we saw a good bit of each other when his children were young and my children were young and they went to the same play school. It's, it's very interesting for me to see those same three children, uh, mm -hmm. Tommy and, and, uh, and Mary Lynn, uh, whom I've known for many, many decades. And they didn't look like that when I first knew them. But on the other hand, we didn't look like this <laughs> in those days. Uh, I, by my layman's reckoning, there's more than three centuries of brown sort of teaching around this table here. And it's hard for you to believe that we were the young Turks at a certain point. It's hard for me to believe this even, but it was the case. So out of those old memories, I remember teaching Faulkner, the French writer Butor, with Tom. I remember when my wife and I were running a program that doesn't exist anymore called the Faculty Fellow Program. And Tom would be routinely invited to come in with his big suitcase, and he would open it up and unpack the hypercube. And the students were reliably amazed, as were the adults who had seen this before. And every time you saw it, it was no less marvelous. And then he would talk to us about art and about Dolly and about the connections with religion. And he would talk about the stories that people had written to him about uh, the fourth dimension. So I found that my own work was being influenced by this, that when I wrote on a colleague who's recently retired, Bob Coover, who's one of our major postmodern writers, I found that the best way to describe one of the things happening in one of his stories was to liken it to the hypercube, where a character would go through all of the possible permutations of his life, things that happened and didn't happen, 
feared, desired, all of that would be written out like hypertext sometimes does. And I thought Tom's hypercube was a really wonderful sort of analog to that. And then I thought about fourth dimensional vision as a way of looking at people, seeing them with the retina, as they are right now, as you are now. But if you know them, if you knew, for example, those children, Banshoff children, then you see them in your mind's eye, of course, as they were a long time ago. And that's what probably fourth dimensional vision might be like. And uh, that's one of the takeaways that I think literature gets from people like Tom. So thank you. I do have to say that uh, Arnold uh, recently came to my class, as everyone else uh, on the panel has done, and uh, spoke about Slaughterhouse Five. And I think the students really appreciated it. And it fits right in with what you said the, the attempt to try to get the fourth dimensional vision that we just don't have. Julie. Julie. <laughs> so um, I think I was along with, with Tom Webb, or maybe not at the same time. I saw. Tom's presentation for the freshmen about the hypercube, and I was in the fourth dimension. I was very inspired um, by many things. One was just the the actual artistic beauty of the of watching the hypercube. It looked like it was dancing to me as a dancer, and I had l heard some music that was sort of very uh, cacophonous and atonal. And I taped it. And I said, "I'm going to do something to this someday." And when I, after I saw Tom's lecture, I thought, "This is Flatland." So I decided to make a piece of called Dimensions, and um, I just want to echo what, um, what Shep was saying, is I never felt like I was trying to do a mathematical version of, uh, the, you know, or so try to be a mathematician. I really felt very much empowered to be a dancer and to look at all the issues and the questions from a dancer's point of view. So the first issue, the, the first part of the dance takes place in Flatland, and because it's a, two-dimensional world, one of the problems as a dancer I had to figure out is how people could actually move. Um, they couldn't pass each other. They couldn't turn around. So I had to explore a lot of uh, different ways of moving. And one of the things that I'd respond to that, that Chef would say about ever working by yourself, dancers tend not to work by themselves. It's almost always a collaborative process from the beginning. We don't really have a notation system. We can't really write it down. We sort of come into a rehearsal with some ideas. But usually from the very beginning, it's a collaborative process. And for this particular piece, it had to be collaborative because we really had to figure out how to do a lot of this stuff. Um, if you've read Flatland, you know that there's a hierarchical um, development of the culture. And so these the original images were people coming in with elastics in different uh, configurations, triangles, moving up the hierarchy, squares, polygons, until they finally um, made a, 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 a circle all together. So this was the first, uh, one of the first images in the piece. It takes place in front of a scrim, so that it was, could be very flat. Um, you can go to the next slide. I think you can. It says connecting. Anyway, so we, we did, dealt with a lot of problems. They had to do cart, we, they, they had to just do cartwheels, they had to hop, they couldn't cross their legs when they walked. Um, there was one scene where we tried to figure out how a, a dancer could pass another dancer if they were on stage already. And we tried to do it with a group by lifting one dancer up and passing her over everybody's head. And we really struggled. We could not do it. So one of the dancers said, my boyfriend's a football player. It was Rick Vallela, who I think some of you may remember. And he, so he came into rehearsal, and he bench pressed the girl over his head and just put her down <laughs> on the other side. So he got cast in the piece, and then he said, I don't want to just do this. I want to be in the whole thing. So he actually danced the whole piece. So this is one other way they can locomote. They could do cartwheels. Um, you can keep going. It's, oh, OK. This, we're having a little technical difficulty. Um, having conversations was an issue, just of various problems that we had. The visitation of, this, of the sphere, If when the next one comes up, I'll Tried to figure out how to do that, and I had a brilliant uh, technical director named John Lucas, who was a magnificent problem solver. Oh, here's the conversation. When she couldn't turn around and talk to him, so in order to look into his face, she had to do a backbend so they could talk to each other. Um, so we, we had a lot of fun just sort of playing with all the... Um, so then this is the, the visitation, which is the visitation of the, of the sphere. And 
the, the way we did, John did it with the, the uh, sphere emerged as a follow spot on the screen. It got bigger and bigger, just as if this, the uh, sphere had gone over the pool, and then came down onto the stage, and one brave A square, the scrim flies, and she goes into the third dimension. And she just watches. She watches them dance. I made a big contrast. The flatland was all gray, and they had these skull caps on. Um, and uh, the third dimension was colorful and very, I tried to play again with as many possible dimensions, three dimensionality, turning, rotating figures. And then she just watches and then she goes back to Flatland to tell everybody what a wonderful adventure she's had and that tries to bring the news, the good news back. And they, she tricks them into, she, she tries to show them that the, the fourth dimension, she takes their hands and then she jumps downstage or upstage, and of course for them she disappears. So she, they think she's some kind of evil spirit and try to destroy her. And uh, she then dares to come back and she re-enters the third dimension and she's taught to dance by a mature couple. I danced in the original version. Yes. Decides to stay and then this is the final, is this the final? Oh yeah, then they, they finally get to this place where there's, and I did this to Bach, I think there was something very, this last section started with the hypercube dancing on the screen to Bach, it was a, and you know, if anybody who knows about Bach's, I mean he was a very spiritual person, I was very inspired by the Dali image of the fourth dimensional cross, so there was a lot of sort of layering of those ideas in the, in the final section, and they actually, um, start to you know, fly and use this, the upper space, which is not something that dancers usually get to use except in, in lifts. And then the last image, um, she, the dancers finally come out on ropes flying, like trapeze artists, and she finally can't, uh, can't take, the, take it anymore and she winds up back in, in Flatland. I just decided for a narrative it shouldn't have a, necessarily have a happy ending. But <laughs> <laughs> And one of the, one of the uh, Tom students who just saw it, they were, she was really mad at me for like, not letting her stay. Yeah. And then she said, well, maybe she can go back. Maybe she just was too tired and she has to like, go back and rest. But yeah. there's still that she's been there, so maybe there's a chance that she'll go back. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, as I talk, can I, I want to even repeat what I think what Shep said about what a great collaborator Tom is. Yeah. And, that, and I also think in terms of what, what Tom just said about Brown being a special place to collaborate. I think it's partly because we really are allowed to be who we are, when, that the collaboration is really an organic thing. I think that one of the sort of byproducts and consequences of the new curriculum that I don't think was ever predicted was that because students don't have to take courses in, or not required to take any courses across discipline, the disciplines actually don't have to try to appeal to everybody in the same way. And I th in some ways that seems like it could be negative. I think the positive is that the, the disciplines are even stronger and partly because the arts are treated in the same way as the uh, other fields, which is not typical in other schools. It's very few schools that have, the arts have the same status as the uh, sciences and the humanities. So that you have these very strong discipline-based people who know exactly what they want and exactly what they want to do and who they are. And that's when I think true collaboration can really take place. If you're kind of wishy-washy, oh, I'm sort of a dancer, but I, then you can't collaborate because what, what do you have? And then you can be flexible. I think like Chef was saying, once you really know what matters and what's essential to you, then you can meet somebody else at that same place and collaborate at a whole nother level. So thank you, Tom, for... This has been one of my favorite projects of all time, doing this, this piece. It's been really fun. I have, to, yeah. I have to say that uh, one of the highlights of this year uh, in my course on exploring the fourth dimension was when we found a tape of the original back in 82? 83. 83. And Julie uh, was one of the two people who uh, provided the uh, uh, the dance, uh, this wonderful pas de deux in the middle, uh, where uh, a square uh, a ballerina was it Tara? Yeah, Tara uh, we, uh, was watching them and seeing all this, and then she came between them, like a, a playing card between two dancers, 
and learned the third dimension from these mature dancers. Gosh, I, I, I get goosebumps just thinking about <laughs> how wonderful that scene was, and I really appreciate that so much. Tom, if I could make a comment, I've seen the dance several times, and every time I see it, as it builds up from the two dimensions to three, especially at the moment the Bach comes yeah. on, it's so beautiful in what the dancers are doing. I always have tears just streaming down my <laughs> eyes as I feel the release and the freedom that that depiction here really brings forth. And of course, Tom's four-dimensional cube is depicted there in the background, yeah. spinning around, and uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Tom and I actually were both on a panel for Julie. Remember when you did the thing on the yeah. chain gang? Yeah, yeah. And we both analyzed uh, this piece that uh, Julie was analyzing herself from other points of view. And just, uh, well, yeah. good stuff. Good stuff. David. Hi. David Hi. Laidlaw. So I guess I'm the computer scientist on the panel. You are. And um, I think I probably represent a couple dozen computer scientists yes. that you've collaborated with over <laughs> the decades. Um, a lot of them were named David. Yes. And so in fact, <laughs> I'm a particularly representative representative for them. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to talk about sort of a series of roles that, um, of collaborative kinds of roles that I played with Tom, mostly, uh, mostly in the order in which they occurred. So I started in 1980 my freshman year as a student in Tom Banchoff's um, Math 54, or Honors Linear Algebra, which was a great class. I think that particular instantiation even might have been particularly good, is that yes. fair oh, to say? it really was, yes. So the students in it were just really engaged, and, and in fact, this is the textbook that Tom handed out. As you can see, it was self-published. <laughs> um, I think later it became actually published. Yes. One mm -hmm. of the things that was great and engaging about the class is it really focused in a geometric sense on this kind of abstract, uh, more abstract topic that mm -hmm. for some people, um, uh, I would struggle with it as an abstract topic, I know. It worked really well for me because of that. I also took his modes of thought class on the fourth dimension, and I borrowed a book from him during office hours. And unfortunately, I guess I got a little carried away with it because uh, as I discovered today again, um, it was on several of my shelves in my office. Um, and I was up so mortified that I destroyed his book, I bought him another one and, and gave him back the, the, the newer one. I actually reminded him of this a couple of weeks ago, and he'd forgotten I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> um, but beyond being a student, I was also a research assistant for him. And I think that's really the, the place where he touched my life the most strongly. Um, he was my first really deep scientific collaborator. I think we both brought, like many of you other uh, collaborators have said, we brought our complementary skills to a piece of joint work or to a number of pieces of joint work. We worked on some animations, some of which movies you'll see on the, the screens around the building. We worked on tons of images. I brought some, some actual slides. These are filmed yeah, for those of you yeah. who might remember that old medium. Um, and uh, we had pictures that that were on magazine covers and mm -hmm. inside of textbooks and the Christian Science Monitor. And I think one of the things Tom was the proudest of is that it was the cover of a rock band record album. Yes. For those of you who remember what records are. <laughs> um, so, but the films were kind of the coolest. And, uh, and we used a 16 millimeter uh, film camera which apparently they don't have projector here in Granoff, which seems like a real oversight. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on. Um, it shot film like this. I brought as a prop to show you what it looks like. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. Um, it's got a whole bunch of little pictures on it. And we, we put those pictures up on a computer monitor that was you know, much less powerful than this thing. Um, and one shot at a time with a little jury rigged shutter controller that, that we built we opened the shutter and closed it and put another picture up and opened the shutter and closed it and it was a little slower than I'm describing in fact. <laughs> yes. And so it would run all night and in the morning we'd come in and get our film and take it down to the Bonanza bus terminal and put it on the bus and in the evening it would come back processed. And we would cut it with scissors and tape it together with tape and make some of the animations that you saw. And, um, and that was really kind of a, a, an exciting process. 
and I think we made some neat stuff with it. Um, Tom and I author, also were co-authors on my very first paper. It was a paper in um, Advances in Applied Mathematics, a journal that I've never read, but um, apparently I suspect you read it occasionally. <laughs> no. Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> well, Fred Bishop and Hussein Koshak from Applied Math were also yes. co-authors, so maybe they read it. Yes. And it was pretty cool as an undergrad yeah. to, be, to be a published author. I think the thing that, that, um, that I take away from that was just the ease and naturalness that, that collaborating with Tom offered, and I think you guys have all echoed that. Uh, I've collaborated with many people in the decades since we collaborated, and they don't all come out quite so naturally and easily, mm -hmm. um, although many of them do, and it's a wonderful way to, to, to work. I do a lot of work that way. But Tom really introduced me to that, I think, and, uh, and that ease and naturalness really gave me a, a, a great introduction, and I really am appreciative of that. So it's been almost 30 years ago since, since I was a student here at Brown, and I was gone from Brown for about half that time, and then I was really excited to be able to come back as a faculty member. I, I understand Tom was a, a champion for me. I heard rumors of that, so thank you for that too, Tom. Yes. And since then, we've been able to do a few projects a little bit with uh, some more shared students, uh, some of, of which, some of whom were even also named David, yes. which yes. was, uh, yes. I think, a good sign. And some of, uh, some of pr which projects are up in the cave now, and you guys can go see them if you haven't already. I think that's really fun. And the last thing I'd like to touch on as a role is that I also came back to Brown as a parent. And two years ago, my older son, Cassidy, who Tom first met when he was five and yeah. talked about math and polyhedra and, uh, and the, uh, uh, what's it called? The Mobius band. The Mobius band, or what happens when you cut it up. Um, my son took uh, linear algebra, the same Math 54 class, a different book this time. Mm -hmm. um, but it was kind of a nice, uh, I don't know, that just feels like kind of a nice close to the story of sort of all the roles that I feel like Tom has, has played in my life. And, and, and I think it illustrates the kind of the influence Tom has had over literally generations of computer scientists and the collaborations he's had with them over decades. And uh, I think on on their behalf and on my, by, my behalf. Thank you, Tom, for all of that. Yeah. Thank you, David. <laughs> Miraculously, we have some time for questions. Does anybody have a question or a comment? You have to speak up. Come on. Somebody. Well, actually, I can use this uh, as an oh. opportunity. <laughs> Let me, uh, let me use this as the opportunity to do something which is very important. The show uh, here, using, trying to use all the material in the Granoff Center, really does involve a lot of cooperation with students, with faculty, with uh, people in the staff. And I can, uh, let's see, in, in 25 minutes, I think I can probably think of all the people who <laughs> Uh, worked with me, but I do want to, to group a few of them. Uh, th three of the people right in front of me here, Kyle and Alec and, and Paul, are with the CIS, the, what do you call it? The Commuter, Computer and Information Services. Uh, the people who do all the videos, uh, sorry, all the videos, all the transcriptions of the, uh, uh, the movies that we've had seen here, all the work of that and, and the videotaping of all the lectures uh, and that have taken place. It's really rather a remarkable group of people, especially Jovi Raz, uh, who I work with very, very closely for several years now and has been working so, so uh, well with this whole project. Tara, who's been doing some of the filming here, Adrian, uh, Richard, uh, names a whole bunch of people in that area. The, uh, people who put together the exhibit are so much fun to work with. Uh, the exhibit that you've seen up in the Granoff Center involved Kira, who's Richard's uh, right-hand person, and Carol in the office there. Uh, Alon Lieberman and uh, Ben Kaplan are just amazing to watch. These are the people who constructed the largest unfolded hypercube anyone has ever seen. Uh, have constructed all these different models we worked together for the last couple of, <coughs> couple of months, and most recently doing all this construction. Um, 
other people, uh, Chris and Sophia, and uh, I'm, I'm going to mess up without uh, saying uh, all their names, but it's really an amazing group of people here in in the center here. The people over in the uh, uh, the uh, uh, graphic services, uh, Kelly in particular, has been very, very helpful uh, getting all the material together that we've been able to hand out. Uh, John Huffman, who is uh, taking the current configuration of the cave. David Laidlaw mentioned that he and I had several joint students, and uh, that was in the early stages of the cave. Uh, I encourage everybody to go up and take advantage of a chance to visit this exceptional facility and to look forward to the facility that's in place that David's in charge of, uh, the new cave, which is going to be much more elaborate in some ways. But I've been guaranteed Every way. That, the <laughs> that, that the kinds of things that we've been doing uh, on uh, the old cave and, and the current configuration uh, is, uh, are going to continue as examples of ways of using immersive reality as a way of trying to get uh, an understanding of how we s see things and think about things and how uh, these challenging topics like fourth dimension uh, really are test cases for some of the new technology and the new ways people can possibly uh, develop materials. Um, I'd like to thank my family who are here. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Rich, uh, Arnold has already mentioned my three children who are actually together in Providence again for the same first time in many years. <laughs> And uh, Lisa Waltuck, who did the, the wall at the end of the uh, stage that really traces out all the, all, all of us here are on that wall, or not me, but everybody else is on that wall. <laughs> and Lenore, who helped me uh, contact Lisa in the very first place to, uh, to, to work on this collaboration. And Kathleen, my wife now, who is the one who really has been around helping the entire, this is one aspect of what it's like to be in my final semester at Brown, teaching at Brown, uh, and uh, to try to see how this all makes some sense uh, to put together 50 years <coughs> worth of teaching and then think about what comes next, because there are things that come next. That's the fourth dimension. <laughs> <laughs> It's seven o'clock. Uh, we can, and maybe we should have a reception. Oh, yeah. Great. So thank you very much for your coming and for your attention. And we'll all be around uh, enjoying uh, the uh, operation of this wonderful place. So thanks again. Thank you.